Today's talk is part of our lecture series, Conversations in Forest History. Our guests today are Sarah Ford and Jessica Bukowski of Forest Carbon Works. Sarah leads their Natural Resources Division. This includes field team activities, verification support, afforestation efforts, and landowner and partner outreach. Jessica is their New England Regional Forester. Jessica assists with project ori origination through landowner engagement and outreach and provides forestry services throughout the Northeast. With that, I'll turn things over to our guests. Great, thank you very much. I'm gonna just share my screen. Okay, everyone can see that. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks again for joining us today. Again, my name is Sarah Ford, and with me today is Jessica Bukowski, and we're joining you from Northern Vermont. Um, it's so exciting to see so many people joining us from such a diversity of locations. We really do have people from all over the world. It's just great. Um, so today, Jessica and I both are going to be um, giving an overview and introduction to forest carbon markets. And we are going to be going over both compliance and voluntary carbon markets, uh, the history of carbon markets in the United States. And we're also gonna go into current carbon market opportunities for US forest landowners, because that really is our focus at Forest Carbon Works. So just really to start out, um, I thought it would be good to just give the high level of view of what are carbon markets. Carbon markets are essentially trading systems in which carbon credits are, are bought and sold. So depending on the market, each system has different rules, regulations, and oversight. One carbon credit is equal to one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. Forest lands produce these carbon offsets through both the carbon carbon storage and carbon sequestration and capture of carbon dioxide. The way that our carbon markets work in a really simplified sense, which this image is showing on the screen here, is such emissions are in the form of atmospheric carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalent are taken in, captured, stored in trees, biomass in our forests. They're then measured, this biomass, um, is inventoried. And then this measurement, um, they're inventoried following the standards of our carbon markets. And then in turn, this determines the amount of carbon credits that can be issued and sold in carbon markets. Again, a very simplified sense. So putting it in perspective, um, as far as really what these carbon offset credits equate to in carbon markets. Um, this image here on the bottom of the screen, I really like because it really helps us equate in the everyday sense what one carbon credit is equal to, um, which probably a lot of folks um, here on this webinar today may be familiar with already. So, um, for example, in the United States, an average car emits an average of 4.75 metric tons of carbon, di carbon dioxide equivalent per year. An average person emits 16 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent annually. And one acre of forest sequesters or captures about 1.3 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. Um, and so again, our carbon markets are those systems or platforms that exist nationally and internationally that provide that mechanism for us to buy and sell these carbon credits. So there's two types of carbon markets that exist, often referred to as one carbon market, which is okay. Um, and so these, these two types of carbon markets are compliance and voluntary carbon markets. Um, the compliance carbon market is a mandatory carbon market, as its name implies, where it is imposed by governments on participants that are legally mandated to reduce their emissions 
often by cap and trade systems that are created as a result of policy or regulatory requirements. Non-mandated companies actually also can participate in compliance markets if they would like to, but they're not required to. The voluntary carbon market um, is, operates outside the compliance market, is voluntary, as its name says, states. <laughs> it allows companies and individuals to purchase carbon offsets on that voluntary basis. So this is the market that is really getting quite a bit of media exposure. Um, we'll talk about this throughout the course of our presentation today. Net zero commitments uh, that are made by companies participating in the voluntary market coupled with improved efficiencies really have driven this increased demand in the market over the last few years. Okay, so there really are some important differences between the compliance and voluntary market. One of the key differences between the two is regulation and oversight. Compliance markets, they're run by governmental bodies. They have centralized oversight and regulation. Voluntary markets are not run by that one centralized body. They're run by NGOs and they um, don't have those legally regulated mandates, therefore. Because of that centralized oversight and regulation, credit pricing in the compliance market historically has been quite a bit higher and more stable than in the voluntary market. However, voluntary credit pricing is actually catching up um, swiftly <laughs> to that of, of compliance carbon market credit pricing mostly due to increased demand in the voluntary market. Participants in compliance markets, they're not required or mandated to reduce emissions the same way, or they are required, pardon me, to reduce emissions, fall in the compliance market. However, they're not in the voluntary market. Um, many participants in the voluntary market still do reduce emissions, by choice in addition to purchasing carbon offsets through that market system. Compliance carbon market participation actually is required by law in some cases. The California Compliance Program is a really good example of this, which we'll go into a bit later. Uh, the voluntary program is of course not required by law. The compliance market really uh, has just overall much more rigorous requirements just by nature of the way that the whole market system works, especially having that one centralized governmental body overseeing it. This includes one standardized methodology that's required for all of the projects participating in that system, require third-party audits or verifications that occur on a regular time sequence and a very long commitment length. Um, the voluntary market has a, therefore a, a much wider spectrum of requirements for participation from by, by projects or of, and therefore we see a, a much uh, larger spectrum in quality of credits and projects within that market. It is also a lot more desirable for participation because the time commitment isn't as long for participants, which we'll also talk about in a little while. So why do folks, do people um, want to participate in carbon markets? So there's a real wide range of these participants in project types, both in compliance and voluntary markets. These include companies that are of a larger size, potentially having much higher amounts of emissions, such as power plants, oil and gas companies. These are often those participants that are required or mandated to participate in compliance markets as they're being required to reduce and cap emissions um, on an annual basis by a set amount each year. Voluntary market market participants have a, a wider spectrum of type and size, including airlines, universities, breweries, even individuals now have the, the opportunity to offset their emissions. Types of projects in both markets include 
renewable energy projects, solar and wind, biomass, um, nature-based solutions like forests, wetlands, and grasslands. And so today, of course, again, our focus is for the most part forest lands, forest projects, and forest carbon markets, and using improved forest management um, as a carbon offset project type. Just really a mouthful, a lot of these forest carbon <laughs> project related terms. So there are three available forest carbon offset project types in the United States right now. These are afforestation, reforestation, avoided conversion, and again, that improved forest management. And improved forest management, which is our focus today and our focus at Forest Carbon Works, are currently, it's the most available program to family forest owners in the United States at least, comprising about 90% of current forest carbon projects in our country, our country being the US. Um, what this project type does is it commits the landowner to a change in management that improves your forest management activities compared to what they were in or would be in the absence of the project over the lifetime of the project. So again, you're committing to improving your forest management through an approved forest management project, hence the name. So participating in carbon markets, um, again, is vo not voluntary, mandatory in a lot of cases. Um, and in other cases, um, people are doing it by choice. And so this dramatic uptick in voluntary market participation, we're seeing really as a result of a lot of these carbon neutral commitments, new policies, new legislative goals. Our forests stand to play a significant role in meeting these emissions reductions targets, specifically this one and a half degree pathway um, that we're really working toward with emissions reductions. Um, this is demonstrated here in this image on the right of our screens, which is probably pretty familiar <laughs> to, to many at this point in time, in that it's fairly common knowledge that many scientists warn that more than one and a half degrees Celsius of warming really could result in very significant feedback, um, environmental, detrimental environmental, um, negative environmental response that results in such things as loss of sea ice and glaciers, tropical and forest, tropical and boreal forest dieback, and really significant alterations in weather patterns. And therefore, to avoid some of these detrimental impacts, um, limiting warming to one and a half degrees, or if not one and a half, two and a half degrees, is really going to require um, this all hands on deck approach, not one solution, but a combination of multiple solutions, forest conservation, curb deforestation, forest protection, being a really critical component of this. Um, considering that as of November of this past year, more than one third of the world's largest companies have announced net zero targets, I think that it's safe to say that we can really only assume that demand is going to continue to grow for the voluntary carbon market in particular, um, which really just emphasizes the importance of integrity and quality within these marketplaces. So now that I've given an explanation of really what carbon markets are, why participate in carbon markets. I'm going to go into some of the history of our compliance in voluntary carbon markets in the United States. Um, on the compliance side, this includes compliance and cap and trade side. <laughs> this includes the Chicago Con Climate Exchange, our California Compliance Offset Program, and the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI. Uh, there's actually 30 compliance carbon markets worldwide, uh, which are valued at over $850 billion. Uh, there's currently three operating in the United States. And you can see in this image on the right that the California market actually ranks fourth in size globally. 
So um, certainly not one of the biggest appliance market, but it markets, but it is right up there. The Chicago Climate Exchange, which was the first, one of the first compliance, or the first compliance style of carbon market in the United States. This was established in 2003 as a cap and trade market that was actually voluntary uh, for participants. And so although it was voluntary, members did commit to reduce their emissions by set amounts or caps. Carbon offsets were used in CCX, so the Chicago Climate Exchange, to help the participants meet climate, um, meet their reductions requirements, um, those that could not be met. And so the program had participants all over the place, major corporations, utilities, financial institutions, activities in all states in the United States, eight provinces in Canada, and 16 different countries. It had 400 members. This included Ford, DuPont, Motorola. Um, and so it is no longer operating. It ceased operating in 2010. And this is because it had a major oversupply in credits. And they actually were trading for as low as a nickel at the time at which it ceased operating and was bought out for a moment by another another exchange and no longer is in no longer in existence. And so CCX functioned by having its members make legally binding commitments to meet those annual reductions requirements. And again, carbon offset projects were used to help those members meet those requirements. And so although it was voluntary, it was helping businesses prepare for potential regulations of greenhouse gas emissions at a lot of multiple, multiple levels, international, federal, regional levels. And it did do this with the onset of the California cap and trade or compliance offset program very soon after CCX ceased, ceased operating. And it was successful as 450 members um, achieved reductions in of 700 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions over the seven years uh, that it operated. 88% of those reductions were through direct industrial emission cuts and 12% were through offsetting. And project types included solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, biomass, which is where forest carbon projects fell under that category. This graph here on the, on the left shows um, just how much credit pricing fluctuated during just one year of um, operations on the, on the exchange, which isn't entirely abnormal in carbon markets. Credits were priced much lower <laughs> at that point in time. The average price of a carbon credit during the lifetime of CCX was $3.26. The um, Valley Wood carbon sequestration project was the first project to be independently verified under CCX. So CCX, the CCX program required its projects to be independently verified, which is a very good metric for quality standard within a program. Um, these credits sold for $3.75, a little higher than $3.26 averages. And so one of the unfortunate situations with projects that were implemented, registered and, and started under CCX is that they now can no longer enroll in another carbon program under another registry with another developer as, as it stands right now. And this is to avoid the double counting of credits that already were issued under that, under CCX with a new program today. So shortly after the collapse of CCX or the Chicago Climate Exchange, California launched their compliance offset program. This was in 2013 as part of their cap and trade program. This required large emitters to um, by law, reduce or cap emissions annually. 
And so it was structured really similarly to CCX, except it required participation. It was mandatory, required by law. Um, and so for those participants that weren't able to meet those annual requirements, they could offset a very small percentage of their emissions each year. Currently, that amount is only 4% that can be offset or bought via allowances annually. The program is overseen by the California Air Resources Board, has really strict requirements for participation. Um, that includes those third-party verifications, audits. Commitments are very long, of 100 years at a minimum, usually 125 years. And all projects follow the same protocol for development. There are six different project types. Those are livestock, mine methane capture, ozone depleting substance, rice cultivation, U.S. forest projects, and urban forest projects. Okay. And so... Um, the California program has allowed California to, to meet its reductions requirements ahead of schedule. So both CCX and California programs thus far really have been successful with their emissions requirements, emissions reductions requirements. Um, California designed its program by setting standards or targets to reduce emissions back to 1990 levels by 2020. That's what this graph on the left is showing. And the program actually met that goal four years ahead of schedule. And so now what they've done is set a 2030 target for a further 40% reduction below those 1990 levels. And although participation is only required for those who are in California, um, you don't have to be located within the state of California to generate offsets for the program. And so the map on the right is showing areas where forest carbon projects exist that are producing offsets for the California program currently. And so because of the nature of the requirements of these programs, especially the long-term requirements. There's a lot of associated benefits that come with this, including wildlife habitat protection, improvements of soil and water quality, watershed protection, all those attached co-benefits um, with conserving large tracts of forest. All right, so I'm gonna hand it over to Jessica now to give us an overview of Reggie. Hi everyone, um, thanks for being here. So the last regional offset program we're going to discuss is called RGGI, which stands for the Regional Greenhouse Gas, in Gas Initiative um, and is centered in the Northeast. So this program involves 11 states throughout New England, as you can see in blue on this map, and is focused on reducing emissions from large power plants. So states in this region can participate in any compliance market, but only large emitters are regulated by this offset program. RGGI is similar to California's compliance market that Sarah just mentioned in that it allows for a small percentage of offset credits to cover emissions, uh, and in this case, it's 3.3%. There are five project types that are eligible to generate these offset credits, including forestry projects like IFM or improved forest management and afforestation. However, enrollment in these forestry projects um, is not that common due to really stringent requirements. Um, and we're not currently working with RGGI at this time, but it may be something that we consider in the future. Um, but it is a very important climate initiative in this region. Other project types that are more common with this program include landfill methane reduction, and use efficiency, and avoided agricultural methane. Another interesting aspect of this program is that participating states are required to invest revenue. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Uh, oh, yeah, thanks. Invest revenue um, from offset credits and allowances directly into the communities in categories like improved energy efficiency, um, renewable energy technology, and even indirect energy bill assistance for some individuals and families. 
So this program has a big impact on both helping communities move towards increased energy efficiency and reducing greenhouse gas emissions from large power plants. So now that we've covered the major compliance markets in the United States, another important type of market is called the Voluntary Carbon Market, or VCM, as Sarah mentioned earlier. So to briefly review, VCM is different from compliance because it is an open market where the private sector can buy and sell carbon credits that represent greenhouse gas removals. And since it's one large market with no central regulation, there are several established registries that monitor quality and track credits bought and sold. And because of this, it's really important to work with a company that uses an approved methodology and established registry so that we can ensure that credits are high quality um, because there can be a lot of variation uh, within the voluntary market. And, you know, we don't have uh, quite enough time to go through a full history of the voluntary market, um, but I wanted to cover a few major international developments that have put some pressure on reaching climate goals using the carbon market to do so. So these include the Kyoto Protocol, uh, which originated in 1997 and went into effect in 2005. This was the first major international effort to slow global climate change. And it set voluntary emission reductions targets for industrialized countries that are participating. And it also established the allowance um, and trade of emission permits. Next came the Paris Agreement in 2015, in which member countries agreed to limit their emissions in accordance with long-term goals, keeping the increase in average global temperatures to well below that two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial level mark. And this is important because many private corporations have been aligning with this goal, utilizing um, the voluntary market to do so. So this has been one of the most influential events in the past few years for growing this market. And then most recently in 2020, an agreement among major airlines to reduce greenhouse gas emissions called Corsia went into effect. And this stands for Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation. And this, uh, this program does allow some use of voluntary credits to reach these goals. So while none of these events have specifically developed the voluntary market, they have put focus on reaching climate objectives and many major companies are aligning with this goal um, through the use of voluntary credits, which has led to the rapid growth we've been seeing over the past 10 to 15 years, probably more like 10. Um, and in the US, uh, the voluntary market continues to grow rapidly with many consumer facing companies participating. Um, it has a rather short history with the first companies beginning to purchase credits only in the year 2000. Shortly after, a number of new registries came online to monitor quality and track carbon credits issued and bought and sold, such as the Climate Action Reserve, the Gold Standard and Vera. And as I mentioned earlier, these carbon registries are crucial to ensuring the quality of voluntary credits and tracking them to prevent double counting. Um, and as the years progressed, a lot of companies, including Google and EasyJet, um, began to lead the way for other companies to become carbon neutral, um, which is a term I'm sure everybody's heard um, quite a bit by now. And as of 2020, um, more than 1,200 large companies have committed to achieving net zero CO2 emissions by 2050, including some very large companies like Disney, Amazon, FedEx, and Walmart. So with all the focus on achieving these climate goals, um, the demand has increased rapidly for VCM credits. In 2020, buyers retired carbon credits for 95 metric tons of CO2 equivalent, which is more than twice as in 2017. And this trend is expected to continue. This graph shows scenarios for the different climate goals reaching either the two degree or 1.5 degree scenarios, but both show exponential growth um, in this market. 
So now that we've discussed a brief history of both the voluntary and compliance markets, we're going to look at the currently available markets for U.S. landowners and what participating in these look like for the individual landowner who owns forested land. And depending on a number of factors, such as size of land holdings, where you're located in the country, and what your management objectives are, there are a number of project types available to participate in both the compliance market and the voluntary market. The two compliance programs available to landowners in any state right now include the California Cap and Trade and a new program called the Washington State Cap and Invest uh, that begins this year. They both regulate only large greenhouse gas emitters and both utilize these programs to help with really ambitious climate goals. For example, in Washington, new limits set in state law include reaching 45 percent below 1990 emission levels by 2030. 70% below by 2040, and net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So for the landowner, enrolling in a forest-based project to generate these credits is currently available, um, but involves strict regulations and oversight. And it usually involves quite a bit of time to set up. However, these compliance credits are very high in quality and do help facilitate long-term forest conservation. And, you know, I mentioned that both of these programs are now available for landowners in any state, but this may not always be the case. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that over time, there will be decreasing emissions cap, um, meaning that both the quantity of offset credits allowed and the overall cap will be reduced over time. So as this cap decreases, these states will prioritize projects within their own states, which may decrease availability to landowners in other states. So just something to keep in mind moving forward. However, if this type of project is an option um, or is of interest, there are many benefits to participating in a compliance project. Typically, these are good projects for larger land holdings with well-stocked, mature forests. And because compliance projects do require a long-term commitment and they can be expensive to develop, um, that's why it works best for larger land holdings. Um, but as I mentioned, they have strict regulations and credits generated from these projects are usually higher in quality and typically valued at a higher price. Um, so that may be a benefit to the landowner. They also offer many co-benefits from associated projects like long-term wildlife habitat, water quality protection, and decreased soil disturbance and erosion. So just to sum that up, this is a really good option um, for landowners with the intention of um, very long-term legacy conservation um, that also have a well-stocked uh, larger property. And if a compliance project is not a good fit for a landowner, um, the voluntary market may be. Because of a different project design, a wide range of forest types and properties can be viable as VCM projects. Um, and they specifically can be a good fit for those needing more flexibility than is allowed under a compliance project or where it was not financially viable, such as properties with less acreage or lower stocking, um, younger recently harvested forests, or those needing more options for project timelines or shorter commitment periods, because um, voluntary projects usually have a shorter commitment period than a compliance project. And quality VCM projects can still help facilitate long-term conservation of forests. So whichever project type might may be of interest and may be an option, um, enrolling in the carbon project can potentially benefit the landowner in many ways. Um, it can help finance forest improvement like TSI or timber stand improvement or invasive species control and help facilitate conservation efforts. It may also reduce the pressure on the landowner to harvest because of financial reasons and offer another pathway for passive management. Um, so whichever project type might be a good fit, the important thing is to choose a quality program to work with. And Sarah is going to briefly discuss this um, before we close out for the day and take on some questions. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Jessica. 
Um, so in our next webinar on Thursday, we're going to go in more detail into some of the carbon program opportunities for forest landowners in the U.S. Um, with an overview of our program and some of those programs. Um, but just quickly, um, at Forest Carbon Works FCW, we do have carbon project options for landowners that own a minimum of 40 forested acres and up. And so really our focus is on that long-term forest conservation via carbon market access for family forest owners. And so by providing that diver diversified revenue stream, in addition to those co-benefits that come with the for long-term forest conservation, um, this is really a really the foundation of our mission at Forest Carbon Works. Um, we also have access to professional foresters like Jessica and myself on staff to help with forest management for our members um, who enroll in our Forest Carbon Program. Um, and this allows for the official accreditation and recognition for forest management practices. And we also provide guidance and forest management planning for those climate smart forest management practices to do such things as enhancing that carbon storage for your woodland for the long term. Um, so just before we wrap up and move into questions, I included a slide here with some resources. Um, I just saw one question to come through in the chat already about just where to find information in general on carbon markets, because there's a lot of information out there. And so this first um, resource that I listed, the Carbon Offset Guide, is a really good starting place that gives um, a great overview of both compliance and voluntary markets nationally and internationally and can direct you to a lot of other resources as well. I refer to it frequently myself. <laughs> um, the California Compliance Program, California Air Resources, Resources Board website is full of actually some really good, believe it or not, easy to follow information about their program. Um, Vera, is one of the main registries for the voluntary carbon market. It's the one that we use um, for our improved forest management program. They're the leading developer for uh, voluntary carbon credits globally. And so their website also has quite a bit of uh, great information about carbon projects on the voluntary side. And then this website, Securing Northeast Forest Carbon, is um, Northeast Focus, but it's a collaborative to uh, provide information about carbon developers, carbon projects, forest carbon management. There's um, some really great videos and resources on that website as well. And then I also included a few links for some really nice landowner friendly uh, climate smart forestry documents. Uh, that I we also use at Forest Carbon Works frequently. You can just Google those names and find them easily online. Um, so with that, um, thank you all so much. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Jamie turn it back over to you for questions. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll have those links available. We'll put them. Uh, we'll we'll figure out how to make them available. But um, none of us were ex expecting uh, those of you watching to, to quickly scribble down all those links. So we'll, we'll send them to you in some form or fashion. Um, but thank you for assembling those and, and making them available. So uh, just a reminder to send your, um, submit your questions through the uh, Q&A forum. Uh, I, this webinar generated so much interest, I got one or two questions emailed to me in advance of the webinar. Um, Tom Rogers had asked, uh, he had shared a link to an article in the Guardian newspaper, which is out of Britain. There was an investigation into Vera and its work. And according to investigators, um, there was three different journalist, uh, journalistic sites doing the investigation. 90% of Vera's rainforest offset credits were con 
labeled as phantom credits. And that didn't result in car actual carbon reductions. So I don't know if you want to address that specifically, but um, it did raise a larger question, which is if, and I know you went over this in the presentation, but if you could touch again on uh, the regulation of forest carbon markets, um, and then as a person or company who wants to invest in carbon credits, how do you, how would one determine the veracity or legitimacy of of a company's uh, standing or the, the selling? Yeah, there's a lot there. <laughs> and I can start, Jessica, um, please, when I'm finished, jump in what I miss. <laughs> um, so the Guardian article uh, has been circulating at Forest Carbon Works, and we've been <laughs> reviewing and reviewing responses as well. Um, and uh, so there, there, as is not, I would say, unfortunately, infrequent, there was a lot of misrepresentation of information in that article. Um, including, um, from what I've read, uh, actually some of the way the research was presented in that article. And so um, what I would encourage uh, as a starting point for folks to do is to read, actually go to the VERA website, which I did include as on that slide. It's vera.org. Is um, Again, they're, they're the leading developer of voluntary credits. And so they oversee standardized methodologies for the development of carbon projects and also the actual transaction of carbon credits. And they um, peer review and update all of their science-based um, components of their program regularly. And so the, what was called out in that article um, were international um, tropical red projects and their baselines. And so essentially, Vera has been improving their baseline calculations for carbon projects. And so the whole way in which the amount of crediting is determined by reevaluating baselines on a more regular basis so as not to overcredit their projects. That was their, their main response. And that's, um, there's no need to, I think, try to compare like what we do at Forest Carbon Works because it's an apples to orange <laughs> type of comparison as far as how we do our projects versus Vera does it. And so without belaboring and going on and on about that, um, it's actually really interesting to read the other side, I would say, of that arg of the argument. But takeaways are that there was some info, a lot of the information in there wasn't ex real science <laughs> that was presented and um, the media took it and, and ran with it. Um, as far as quality, this is really, really important um, in all carbon, carbon programs, carbon projects. Uh, in the on the voluntary side where there is that spectrum. And so there's starting to be much more um, engagement and collaboration for regulation of quality. There's some things called the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative, which started a few years ago, which is actually mandating some level of regulation on participants in the voluntary carbon market. So as just somebody who is wondering if what they're doing has quality behind it. Um, you can actually do your own research if you want to look at, um, you know, what is behind that project and also look at, is it being actually regulated by a third, overseen by a third party? So like Jessica mentioned, follow an approved tested methodology make sure that the credits that you might be looking to buy are actually real credits and are registered somewhere because they don't always have to be in the carbon, in the voluntary carbon market. Is your project being looked at or verified by another party? These are all signs of quality. Um, in our opinion, the time frame of the project for a forest project is also a sign of quality as far as what are those other things that are behind the project, they're attached to the project that you're doing. And these are becoming more and more important to credit buyers themselves. That's my piece on quality and integrity. <laughs> and okay. 
the Guardian article. And Jessica, if you'd like to add anything, please do. I think you did a really good job okay. covering it. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> um, so if I'm hearing you correctly, it is, it's a, um, a little bit of buyer beware, but it's it's on any investor to do their research and due diligence before spending their money. There, um, there's other companies that you can use that will actually do it for you if you like as well. But mm -hmm. I mean, there's just some really key indicators you can look for um, that we'll talk about again on Thursday as well, as far as you know what to look for in a quality carbon carbon project. Um, and so the compliance on the compliance side, those indicators are mandatory because of just the nature of the program. They're not necessarily mandatory on the voluntary side. Becoming more valuable, I think. And now with like Corsia and, you know, all of these, the greenwashing and, you know, all of the, the media exposure for the good, the bad and everything in between with a carbon credit. John Oliver <laughs> being another one. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so another, and I, this was touched on in the presentation, but um, I want to get a little clarification because this is in that same area of concern for anyone looking to invest. Um, that if you could discuss, um, and this is also a question in the the Q&A roughly, um, this notion of what some call double dipping. Um, let me make sure, you know, I'll pull from, well, it's that, it's, you know, how is it that, um, it has to do with standing forests and getting credit for what already exists. Um, I apologize. I I kind of I think part of the question is also about um additionality in in carbon projects and so if the land is already protected and conserved mm -hmm. uh, you know why what is the carbon project doing? <laughs> um and that that was that part of the question? Yeah, Thurston Morton who's a a landowner up in in Virginia says, I've, I've never understood why we give credit to carbon emitters for buying forests that are already there. Why is a company allowed to offset its carbon emissions, <clears throat> i.e. keep emitting, by using forests that are already in place? And they were already absorbing carbon before, any, before the creation of carbon markets. Um, so maybe uh, explaining yeah, just explaining how uh, th how that works again. Yeah, I can start out with that one, and, and Sarah can answer it if you want. So before we calculate how many credits may be issued from a forest, we calculate what's called a baseline. And people only get credited for something that's additional, so something that's above that baseline. Um, and that baseline takes into account sort of a business as usual approach for that region. So what forest type is already there? What's a typical management strategy for that region and that forest type? Um, and then how can we improve that to sequester and store more carbon? And that's really the essence of the IFM or improved forest management approach. It are things like increasing rotation age and increasing stand dynamics and stand structure to be able to improve the health of that forest and also sequester and store more carbon than it would under a baseline a standard scenario. So the credits issued are only for anything above that baseline, um, which creates that additionality that's so important to these forestry projects. Um, and similarly, if I can add to that, somebody also asked um, if people can have their land conservation easements with the conservation organization and enroll in the carbon offset program. And this is related because if a conservation easement is too strict and doesn't allow any cutting, then no, like it would not really, it wouldn't be allowed in the carbon program because we can't show the additionality. Like if it's already protected, um, we wouldn't be able to show that additionality. So um, 
I hope that helps clarify. So that it's, so I'm going to state the obvious. It's complex and there's a lot of nuance. And to go back to what Sarah was saying with the Guardian article, there's a lot that can be misunderstood, misinterpreted, or not conveyed correctly in some of these media reports, as well as just what's floating around in, in the um in discussions, you know, around around the the work table, the uh, break table, the table in the break room, or the the breakfast table, because uh, some of what I was um, bringing up was exactly what I've you know in ca casual conversations with some folks who have heard of carbon markets but are not, and you know this is not their uh, bailiwick. So um, thank thank you. Um, one person says in the compliance based market, do the regulations and metrics vary or do they vary a lot by country or government? That's a good question. Um, it's a little hard <laughs> for me to speak to that as I'm most familiar with the U S and actually the California compliance market has Quebec has joined with the California compliance market. So um, there, of course, is some variability. I can't speak specifically to what that is, but there also um, is speculation that more of these larger compliance markets may end up um, joining. So are mimicking each other as more come about. So like the Washington market that Jessica was presenting, presented about is set up exactly like the California market. And so, although that's within the United States, I mean, I think people aren't trying to rewrite the script exactly with these markets, if anything, learn and improve as they move forward. And so there's certainly variations in project types um, nationally and internationally, just by nature of force type <laughs> and ecosystem. But um, so hopefully that was enough of an answer. Jessica, right. I don't know if you know anything additionally about that that I don't. <laughs> no, I would say that they're probably some similar characteristics, but without, you know, studying every single one globally, I don't have anything else to add to that now. Once somebody has established a, a model that works, or a marketplace that works to find her, you know, why reinvent the wheel? Why, you know, yeah. um, you can then build and fine tune from there. Uh, Hiromi were, were a gay guy, I apologize, um, who's a student at Purdue University, uh, asks, what is the best way to learn all about all the carbon market projects in the US? <clears throat> also, what are the major standards and aspects to compare different projects? Would this be something, uh, that list of links that you provided, might those that answer uh, be nested in there? It is, there's a great, um, that carbon offset guide is a great start. And there's a there are a couple great tables in there that compare the standards. Actually, they compare registries between the different markets, compliance and voluntary. And so um, we didn't go that deep on purpose in this presentation, um, really going down the list of all the individual registries. But once you start reading and learning about the carbon registries, you'll learn a lot more about the standards and the carbon offset guide will point you <laughs> to those main, main registries, which are not, they're international, the registries. For the in, for all the compliant all the markets that operate internationally, obviously, so the voluntary market being the main one. Victoria in Spain uh, says, "I'd like to know if the standards for carbon markets include any regulations as to avoiding monocropping, genetically modified or improved plantations, uh, and also taking into consideration what kind of land is being used." 
Yeah, I can speak to um, afforestation, and then Jessica, maybe you can speak to improved forest management because there's standards for each. And I'm working a lot in afforestation right now, actually, because we have a program we were just we're working on about we've been working on for a year, forest carbon work. So on the afforestation, so tree planting side, um, your many of the standards do not allow gen genetically modified. Um, species and there's strict regulations surrounding plantations as well. So they do take that into account. And then on the improved forest management side, Jessica? Yeah, it's a similar approach. So a lot of the standards and methodologies um, don't allow planting of non native species um, and then would also encourage removal of invasive species um, as part of the, the you know, forest management approach. And then sometimes, um, you know, there's additional certifications like FSC or Forest Stewardship Council that really reinforces that um, to make sure that we're managing in the best possible way. Okay. Uh, Thorsten Morton is very active on the, the question, but he had, he had a question that, or poses a question that occurred to me as well. When, when you put up the that uh, slide showing uh, emissions and sequestration. So his question is, um, if the average person emits 16 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year, but a forest sequesters only 1.3 metric tons, how do we make the math work? His, his quick uh, back of the envelope math says it would take about 21 acres of forest per person to offset just my carbon alone? Um, yeah. <clears throat> how, how does this work? How do we balance the, the scales here? So, so that is, it's great feedback. And I was a little hesitant on that acre, one acre of forest because um, there's two ways to account for carbon in the forest. The carbon that is stored, like the sink essentially, that already is in the, woody biomass of tree trunks, branches, roots, which we also account for um, in many of the methodologies. And then the additional carbon that's being captured as the trees grow each year, which gets turned via photosynthetic processes, gets <laughs> turned into that woody biomass. And so um, the you know, that carbon storage number, the reservoir in the forest is much higher. It's anywhere from, you know, 40 to 80 to 100 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. It's actually hundreds in a lot of areas of the country. And so when you add that on top of the sequestration number, then the, the math adds up. And so I, um, I just kept put one number in for simplicity's sake. However, mm -hmm. it's still a little confusing. <laughs> okay. Wesley Ward uh, asks, why doesn't uh, Reggie accept forest carbon projects? And is there uh, any voluntary market development in, on the horizon in the Northeast and Southeast? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so. So Reggie does accept forestry projects. It's listed as one of their five project types. Um, it's just similar to other compliance projects. They're very difficult to um, sort of develop um, and enroll in, and it may not work for a lot of uh, forest owners, um, but it is listed as one of their five project types. And as for your question about the voluntary market, so the voluntary market doesn't really have boundaries. Um, anybody in the Northeast or the Southeast or anywhere in the country is welcome to participate in the voluntary market. And landowners in that area can enroll um, their properties in some of these voluntary market projects. And similarly, companies and or individuals can buy voluntary market credits um, throughout those regions as well. So I, I would just, foresee that that will continue um, to grow rather than developing a new voluntary market because it's really just like one big market. Um, so that okay. answers that. David Adima asks a really interesting question. So um, from a career path stand, uh, 
He says, do you feel uh, the Forester credential is necessary for someone interested primarily in coastal carbon projects like mangroves, seagrass, and peatlands? Um, he says, I've taken applicable forestry classes, but it seemed that the Forester credential is limited in its use to a coastal manager. So uh, the bigger question would be then uh, for somebody college age or just uh, maybe fresh out of college looking to go back to grad school, what are some degree programs, not schools, but areas of uh, study to be looking at if they want to get uh, it sounds like in his case, he wants to be down at the coast where there's less or fewer uh, forests per se. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, that's a little bit out of my area of expertise, but I would mention that each state and region usually has their own forestry requirements. So I would check um, in the region that uh, this person would be interested in working to see what the legal requirements are um, for doing forestry and what kind of licensing is required. Um, would be helpful place to start, I think. Yeah, I would say car carbon in general is definitely, it's a very niche <laughs> sort of um, field. It is, it's unique, it's growing, and there are starting to be more opportunities for education, certainly online education, um, different I know SAF has been doing the Society of American Foresters um, online carbon classes from time to time. And so that's a great addition or great start um, for somebody who is interested in building that base knowledge. Um, I, I'm also not extremely experienced, <laughs> super well experienced in the, in the coastal carbon, um, but as far as requirements, some of those might come down to protocol inventory sampling requirements that maybe not a wouldn't require traditional forester education, but um, you could actually gain by um, gain experientially potentially as well. Um, so not to be prohibited, I'd say, um, feeling like you don't have the educational requirements necessary without at least first looking into what um if you're interested in an area of what you know what they might be seeking okay well we have a lot of questions i'm gonna um <laughs> be a bit more um i apologize to those who put in their questions uh they, i don't know that we'll get to them all but uh, Verna asks, what is the status of recognition for below ground carbon sequestration <clears throat> through forest projects? One issue in Coulterville, California, where Verna is writing from, is that those below ground stocks may be retained even if the above ground stock burns in a wildfire. And yeah, so that depends on the methodology. Um, and so certain methodologies do account for soil carbon um differently than others and so i'm still learning in, in about that um in that area i would say um we haven't yet accounted for it at forest carbon works but we're looking into it and hoping to add it um to one of our new methodologies that we're using in general accounting for soil carbon um is um can be challenging in the same way that you know ag Agriculture is having a hard time adding forest carbon to um, just adding forest carbon projects in general, just because it's really hard to measure. There's so many different changes that are very climate influenced. So quite a bit of monitoring is needed to really like effectively measure and monitor. And so we're we're hoping to get there. Um, wow. Let's see. Zachary Johnson, bear with me. Many of the technologies for carbon markets are offsets or increased efficiency, like through yeah. wind or solar, and they're not sequestration per se, but it seems that many of the markets have both. As those types of programs are fundamentally different, is there different pricing or are they lumped? He doesn't say, but are they lumped together? Um, how does the durability of sequestration impact price? Uh, 
So each credit has a serial number attached to it from the project from which it's mm -hmm. generated. And so that is where um, quality is a really important factor. And so a forest carbon project uh, would be priced and valued differently than say a solar wind geothermal project. Um, and so that is a really important key component on the marketplace. And this is where really integrity and quality stand to really, they'll stand out <laughs> with, with, with projects. And so just to give you a quick number, um, compliance credits are, you don't know, they're tracking at probably right around $16-ish a carbon offset credit. Voluntary credits were four or five dollars only two-ish years ago and now they're up around two to fifteen probably twelve to fifteen dollars for a really high quality uh, forest carbon credit in the voluntary market but there's going to be a spectrum and they're going to fluctuate quite a bit depending on the project and time <laughs> Okay, this, this is a pragmatic question, but I find it interesting. Can a forest carbon project and riparian zone improvement project exist on the same property? I think I can take that one. Um, the short answer would be probably um, if there's a lot of forested area um, that's not necessarily um, being conserved for riparian buffers, then yes. So we wouldn't want to just have a riparian buffer in our project that doesn't allow any cutting um, because then we wouldn't be able to show additionality. However, we have many projects that do follow those BMPs or AMPs or riparian improvement areas. We certainly don't want people disrupting those areas. So yes, when we have a project um, that's a large forested area, we simply model in those riparian improvement zones or buffer areas to reflect the management that's happening on the ground, and you can still have a carbon project on the remainder. Uh, Buck Vandersteen asks, what's the shortest amount of time a landowner needs to hold their forest to receive credits? So this is where there's the real spectrum and type of project. And so we have everything from a one-year harvest deferral program that exists that we'll, we'll go into a bit more detail about next week when we go through the different opportunities to um, 125 years or and up is the, is the longest um, as far as what's out there for options. Okay. And payment variation as well. Um, I think we're... Well, Mac McClure asks, what happens to landowners who lock in with long-term contracts, like yeah. up to 100 years, for example, when later contracts might be selling for much higher levels? Can uh, It sounds like he's asking, are contracts subject to renegotiation or do you lock in and that's that? Um, I, I can talk, I can tackle this one. So it really depends on the project developer that you're working with. Um, most project developers do have you lock into a contract, um, but we're going to discuss this a little bit more on Thursday at Forest Carbon Works. We have a revenue sharing option um, for landowners that can, where the price can adjust going forward. Um, Sarah, can, if you want to add more to that, or perhaps, you know, we're going to get into that on Thursday as well. So. The only thing I would add is that rather than be locked in for the whole 125 years, we break our your their shorter contacts contracts <laughs> nested within the longer term contract. Um, so you you are committed to the whole project length as a whole, but you're only committed to Forest Carbon Works or whoever the developer is for a shorter time within the longer time. Uh, I do want to thank Sarah Ford and Jessica Pakowski of Forest Carbon Works for this great presentation.